Well, good morning, Walden Church. For the past few weeks, we have been going through a sermon series on joy. So I just thought maybe in the next couple weeks, we'd look at another three-letter word, the word yes. <laughs> I think a lot like joy, yes, I think it's just another word that we need more of. It's a powerful word and probably a word that we don't get to hear much anymore. On the other side of this, there was a poll conducted in 2021 of American adults of the most annoying word, right? <laughs> they asked people in 2021, what was the most annoying word? You know what, the, you know what it was? You know what the most annoying word was? Whatever, it was whatever. Whatever came in 38%. So respondents found it the most annoying word. Not surprisingly, uh, whatever has been at the top of America's most annoying words for about the last 10 years, but yet it constantly gets used. And I don't know what the word is. It's, 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 like, it's like hearing somebody's eye roll audibly you know, whatever. <laughs> in second place was no offense. No offense, but, right? No offense, but. 20% said that was the most annoying word. And then third place was, you know, right, or I can't even. Those both tied for 11%. So, you know, right, like that, or I can't even, 11%. And then oddly enough, this was the weird one, for me, I didn't understand this one. Huge, H-U-G-E, huge, came in in fourth place with 8% of Americans, huge. But we're talking about yes. Yes is a word that we love to hear because yes is more than a word, right? It, it's a state of being, it's relating, it's a gateway to curiosity and to growth and exploration and resilience. Lately, it seems, with the world out there and the cancel culture and the easily offended, we hear the word no a lot. I hear a lot of no in my day to day. And I think perhaps even the outside world maybe even expects Christians to say no a lot or to think that God is perhaps the God of no. I mean, to be fair, right, there is some truth in that because the Ten Commandments, there's a lot of thou shalt nots, right? There's a lot of no. So this morning, I wanna look at a story from Jesus. We're gonna be in Luke chapter nine, and we're gonna look at three different encounters. Jesus is walking down the road with his normal group of people, and we start to see in, uh, the story, starting at verse 57. Three times, Jesus is gonna be approached by potential followers, candidates, people who are applying <laughs> to be followers. Maybe they say uh, they wanna follow, and so they go up to Jesus and say, Jesus, I wanna be, be your disciple. Starting at 57, it says, as they were going along the road, someone said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Now, in this passage in Luke, we just call him a man. He's, he's just nondescript, right? But when you read this same passage in Matthew, the text says this man is a scribe. So there's more to the story here, probably, but chances are, as a scribe, this man tr might be trying to advance himself you know, maybe tie his wagon to the Jesus train and uh, maybe get ahead, hey, get, get a leg up, get more noticed, right? Because scribes were educated already. They already had some notoriety. So perhaps this scribe sees Jesus gaining popularity and then says, well, I want to be a part of that, right? I want more of that. And as Jesus is getting more and more popular, and more people are starting to group around him, I think it's pretty obvious that he's not just some average rabbi, right? 
Word's getting out. He's a mover. He's a shaker. Things are happening. And so this scribe sees Jesus passing by and he says, ooh, 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 take me, take me, right? And what does Jesus say? <laughs> he says, y you, you want to follow me? <laughs> no, you don't. <laughs> Why not? Well, it doesn't sound like an answer that Jesus would give. You'd think he would say, yeah, of course, come follow me. But it sounds almost like Jesus knows where this man wants to go in life. And Jesus says, I'm not going there. Notice the man says, I'll follow you wherever you go, right? I'll follow you wherever you go. But Jesus, he knows the man's heart. And he says, I don't always go fun places. In fact, sometimes I sleep outside, he says. And if you follow me, it'll be like camping. We'll be roughing it. And I don't mean to offend you, but you don't really look like the roughing it type. So the man says, no, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll follow you wherever. But Jesus can see something there, something that's telling him this man doesn't have what it takes. He's not willing to push all his chips forward and go all in. It's like playing poker. You ever watch those world championship of poker shows when they come on TV? Man, there's a lot of strategy to playing poker, lots of concentration in those games. But now it's almost humorous because they have allowed poker players to start wearing hats and sunglasses and they get to listen to their own music and headphones. And now poker players are doing everything they can, right, to, to not give something away. Everyone's acting really nonchalant and casual and breezy and nobody wants to tip off whether they have a good hand or a bad hand. Jesus said once in John chapter 10, he says, I came that you may have life and have it to the full. In other words, Jesus says, I came so that you would have a winning hand. You would have a winning hand with me. So if you have a winning hand and you know it, then you go all in, right? You go all in. In other words, if you're going to reap the rewards of life, there's going to be a little bit of cost. It's going to cost you. You have to risk it all if you want to claim it all. Everything's in the pot, whether it's your abilities, your talents, your family, your possessions, your bank account, your time, your life. You push it all forward. Going all in is saying yes to God in every aspect of your life. Listen, if you want to experience a rich and satisfying life, then you need to say yes to God. In other words, yes, Lord, right? That's the caveat. Yes, Lord. And as much as we enjoy hearing the word yes, God enjoys hearing the word yes too. But we don't often say yes, Lord, right? We say yes, if. Yes, if. This man approaches Jesus, probably saying, I'll follow you wherever you go if you're going to the Hyatt Regency or the Hilton, right? I'll follow you if you go to the places I want to go. I'll follow you, Lord, if you just bring that person back to me. I'll follow you, Lord, if you just help me get my job back. I'll follow you, Lord, if you just keep me healthy, I'll follow you if my life will get better. And I get it. I know why. I know why we say that. Because we're hesitant. We're hesitant to push it all forward. We're hesitant to let go of our stuff. It's a difficult thing to let go and push it all out into the center. But trust me, Jesus, remember what we talked about last week? Just Knowing him, just knowing God is better than anything else this world has to offer. And this rush that you'll receive by pushing it all forward and saying, Jesus, it's all yours. I trust you completely. The person who can say that 
is the person who realizes that life is not about themselves. It's about him. So I'm going to say yes. I'm going to say yes. I'm going to start by saying yes. I'm going to say yes to him no matter what happens. I'm going to say yes no matter if I stay healthy. I'll say yes no matter if I keep or lose my job. I don't need conditions or attachments on my yes. And if you can learn to say, yes, Lord, yes, Lord to God, the more trust you can display, the more faith you can demonstrate, then you will experience all of God's yes. You'll experience all of God's blessings. Jesus could tell this guy still needed some earthly security. He wasn't ready to sleep outside. He wasn't ready to travel from city to city. That's why Jesus says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. So we may lose some earthly security saying, yes, Lord. But following Jesus means saying yes to heavenly security. See, I don't know, maybe the scribe wanted fame or fortune, or perhaps he just wanted the safety of worldly comfort. But Jesus wanted this man to know that it wasn't always going to be a cushy ride following him. Following Jesus might not always take us through creature comforts, but it does secure us, the heavenly ones. In another place, Jesus talked about worldly security and following him. He said, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break it and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. You see, many people think that following Jesus is a good idea until they realize that there is a cost to following him. But Jesus' teaching is that his followers have to be willing to surrender all of those creature comforts, in order to have the heavenly ones. And this is one of the scary things about Christianity, isn't it? It is. Because we we all like the word yes. We do. It's a great word. We love it, right? We love the word yes. But nobody likes the word surrender. We don't like the word sacrifice. But that's what saying yes means. And so, well, I think we could argue that Jesus enjoys saying yes, and he wants to give you a yes-filled life. Jesus doesn't just say yes to everyone who goes, ooh, 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 pick me, pick me. Jesus didn't pick everybody. Jesus was honest. He was straightforward. He said it like it was. And he said, you can follow me, but it's not cheap. It's going to cost you something. Following in verse 59, to another he said, follow me. But he said, Lord, let me first go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, leave the dead to bury their own dead. But as for you, go and proclaim the kingdom of God. You ever read that and then just think, wow, that was, that was a little harsh. <laughs> Do you ever think that? Like you read this and you picture a guy and he's holding a shovel and he's standing next to his dad's coffin and he says, yeah, you know, I really want to come, but, you know, I, I, can I, I just need to bury my dad first. And Jesus says, meh, forget it. <laughs> that's, that's probably not what's happening. This man says he would gladly follow Jesus, but, right? He says, but, but he had some other business to take care of. He said he had to go and bury his father. But see, this could mean anything. In fact, we don't even know if his dad's dead, right? To, to take care of your parents for a Hebrew, this is a religious duty that belonged to the son. And right now, it takes precedence over everything else. So let's say his dad isn't dead. And he's just asking Jesus, you need to wait because he's at death's door. And we'll just wait for the natural order of things. So 
Who knows how long that'll be, right? But if his dad was already dead, then there would have to be funeral procedures. That would have to get going. And for back in this time, uh, the dead were buried the very same day. But more than likely, this man is asking for permission to settle all of his dad's accounts, right? Settle all of his dad's affairs. So sometimes burying someone, right, it's more than just the physical act. Sometimes it also involves the will and the estate and the transfer of papers and paying off of debts and settling accounts and also mourning. There, there's a lot going on. Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead. And I know that sounds harsh, but that's because it is. <laughs> it is. When, what Jesus is saying is, if you stay here with your father, then you're dead too. Physically dead, no, no, not physically dead. Remember, Jesus is not as concerned about our worldly comfort. No, he's talking about being spiritually dead. Some things may have to go on the back burner if we say, yes, Lord. But following Jesus means saying yes to him being first. So whether this man is trying to fulfill a duty or he's waiting for some, you know, inheritance or financial security, or maybe he's just trying to do this so that everybody in the family is happy, whatever. Ultimately, he doesn't want to commit to Jesus yet. He had something else that was more important. This, this time the man's answer wasn't yes, if, it was yes, but. Yes, but. It's the, it's the yes, but answer. Will you follow Jesus? Yes, but... The man wasn't fully committed. And Jesus challenged him. He said, you know what? If you were all in, you'd go right now. But my dad isn't dead yet. And I want to see if I'm in the will. Yeah, but that's not going all in. You're still holding on to some earthly security. Jesus has to be first. Jesus has to take precedence. You know, I get that you have obligations and loyalties, but following Jesus means he comes first. It means saying, yes, Lord. This is why you'll often hear pastors talk about bringing your first fruits whenever they preach about tithing, right? Because it's a Bible passage. Proverbs 3 says, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce. What does that mean? Well, it means first, <laughs> right? It means first. Yeah, I know a good rule of thumb with God is tithing 10%, but, you know, I've always, I've always wondered, is that before taxes or is that after taxes? I don't know, but the Bible says first, <laughs> right? That's what we know. It says first, and typically first comes before, right? First comes before, not after. Why do we give to God first? Because first means there's no hesitation. First means there's no holding back. First means I don't have reserves. First means I don't have a second chance. First means I don't have an easy out. First says I'm all in. I'm in it to win it. And see, that's our problem right there. We hold out on giving because we want it as a safety net, just in case. Just in case something happens. I mean, we'll give, but we wait. We wait until our earthly responsibilities are taken care of. Here comes the offering plate, and it's, oh, honey, how much do you have on you? Do you, you, still, have the, you still have the change from the restaurant last night? We don't go all in. We hold out on God. We hold out on God. And what happens when we live that way? We lose, right? We lose. Ask any poker player if they got rich playing it safe. When you act cautiously, when you act hesitantly, if you play that way, the other players will notice and they will bleed you dry. 
But see, part of saying yes to God is that he wants to give you an abundant life. Right? John 10, Jesus says he wants to give you an abundant life. He wants to give you a winning hand. But it's contingent on your trust. It's contingent on your ability to say he's first. He takes priority. Look at the rest of the passage that's in Proverbs. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all you produce. And then verse 10 says, and then your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will be bursting with wine. God says, give to me first and I will take care of everything else. Right? Because it's not just about our finances where we say, yes, Lord. We say, God, I will follow you. But first, I have to go through this this season of my life. I'll follow you, but I, you know, first I got a, I got a bunch of other projects on my plate. You know, I'll follow you, but I'm really behind on my shows and I really got to catch up. Uh, and you know, I'll follow you, but my kids need my time or my husband needs my time. My business needs my time. I got a lot of things going on in my life. I will follow you, but my relationship with is on the rocks. I'm, I'll follow you, but I'm just such a I'm such a sinner, I'll follow you, but my addiction follows me around. I'll follow you, but I have these secret things I won't let go of. But see, here's the thing about following Jesus. Jesus never says, fix yourself and then follow me. He doesn't say that. He says, follow me as you are, I will fix you. Last encounter, verse 61. Yet another said, I will follow you, Lord, but let me first say farewell to those at my home. Jesus said to him, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the kingdom of God. You have a, you have a plow? I'll, I'll let you go check. You want to go to your garage and check to see if you have a plow? You probably don't, right? But you have a lawnmower, right? You probably have a lawnmower. Okay, so you're mowing the lawn. All right, picture yourself, you're mowing the lawn. Where do, you, where do you look when you mow the lawn? Where should you look? If you were gonna teach someone else to mow the lawn, where would you tell them to look? Straight ahead, right? You look straight ahead. Do you look down? No. Do you look back? No, you look straight ahead, why? Because you want nice clean lines, right? You want those nice clean lines. If you look around, sloppy. You want those nice, even lines. So you focus and you walk straight forward, right? Jesus says, same with me. He says, same with me. When you follow Christ, you walk forward. You look towards him. You are moving toward him in faith. You are all in, right? The past is the past. We're moving forward. Here's another person who says, oh, oh, oh. I'll follow you, Jesus, but (laughs) first let me go back, right? He says, first let me go back. But you know what? It's a trap. It's a trap. Going back can freeze us up. Going back locks us up. When we think about all the things that happened in the past, how many of you are living your day-to-day and you're still thinking about things that happened to you in the past. People who've treated you or hurt you in the past, and it affects your today. Your past can have some dark pockets, but we learn from them and we move forward. Don't allow your past to keep you from moving forward. 2 Corinthians 5 says, anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. The old life is gone. A new life has begun. The Bible says you're a new creation, right? You have a new life. You have a new beginning. So you need to learn to embrace that and move forward. Some things in your past, yes, they may go unresolved. But saying yes, Lord, means following Jesus and moving forward. You know, this man, he just wants to say goodbye to his family, right? Doesn't seem 
nothing wrong with that. Doesn't seem weird. He wants to say goodbye to his family. Reminds me of another story in the Bible. A story in 1 Kings. Elijah, the prophet, he was looking for a disciple. Hmm, much like Jesus. And he comes across a man named Elisha, the son of Aphat. And what does the Bible say that he is doing? So he departed from there and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen in front of him. And he was with the 12th. Elijah passed by him and cast his cloak upon him. And he left the oxen and ran after Elijah and said, let me kiss my father and mother and then I will follow you. And he said to him, go back again for what have I done to you? And he returned from following him and took the yoke of oxen and sacrificed them and boiled their flesh with the yoke of the oxen and gave it to the people and they ate. Then he rose and went after Elijah and assisted him. Wow. <laughs> that story has got to be what Jesus is talking about, right? It has to be. This man wants to do the same thing here that his, his hero, Elisha, did. He wants to follow. He wants to learn from a great teacher. So to follow in his footsteps, he wants to start his journey the same way Elisha started his. Seems, seems all right. This poor guy talking to Jesus just wants to say goodbye to his me, and his papa, right? What's wrong with that, Jesus? Yeesh, you're such a stick in the mud. <laughs> but see, here's the thing. Jesus understands exactly what this man is asking. He knows the story too. And he answers with an answer from the story. It's a nod to Elisha. And it's a nod to the reference he makes. But this time, it's about plowing the field, right? Right? He was plowing a field. So what is Jesus saying? He could be saying, I'm not Elijah. And you're not Elisha. But this, what's taking place right now, this is even bigger than that. Like you want to go back to that story in the past? This, this story now that we're, that we're creating together, this is bigger than that. And if you can't see that, then maybe you don't need to be a part of this story. Saying yes to Jesus means you shouldn't put anything above or ahead of Jesus. It means there's nothing you shouldn't be willing to give up. By the way, did you notice how in the first King story, Elisha, when he went home, right, before he followed Elijah, he literally... I mean, that word. I mean that. He literally burned his bridges, didn't he? He took all of his ox and he burned them. It was his way of proving, I am never going back to that old way of life. Elisha was all in. Elisha said, yes, Lord. And Jesus is better than that, right? Jesus is the brass ring. He's the, he's the blue ribbon. He's the Oscar. He's the Academy Award. He's the master's degree. He's the doctorate degree. Jesus does not take second place in your life or third place or fourth. He needs to be first in every aspect of your life. See, I think most of us are happy to give Jesus our church life, right? Maybe we even give Jesus Sunday, Right? We give him all of Sunday. But the rest of the week? <laughs> what about the rest of your life? See, make no mistake, Jesus expects 100% all of your dedication from all of his followers. Not, not half, not some, not part. What, what, how, how much of your spouse do you want? How much commitment do you want from your spouse? There's, there's no love scene <laughs> in any movie where the couple is looking into each other's eyes and the man says, I love you with all of my heart. And then the lady replies, and I love you with 43% of mine. <laughs> right? 
That would be a terrible movie. But 45% sounds like a lot. It does. Man, I give God 45%. That's a lot. I don't care if it's 99.9%. It's not enough. Seriously, it's not enough. Why not? Because Jesus says anything less than your life is not acceptable. Jesus says there's a cost. There's a cost to following him. Those three that wanted to follow, they did not count the cost. And Jesus tells us there is a cost to saying yes. Matthew 16, 24, Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Do you know what denying yourself means? It means saying, yes, Lord, a hundred percent. A hundred, a hundred percent. A few weeks ago, our uh, Bible study, our small group on Wednesday, we were talking about things that cause division in the church, things that cause fights and hurt feelings. And the group, we came up with a lot of different topics, but you know what is at the root of every division in the church? Me, self, right? Pride, selfishness, egotism, self-interest. She's got a bigger cookie than me. Right? This cancel culture movement, these people that get so easily offended, it's about them. What offends them? What they don't like? Last week we saw Jesus talk to his disciples. They were arguing about which one of them was first. And what did Jesus have to do? He had to take them aside and say, it's not about you. Mark 9 says, whoever wants to be first must take last place and be the servant of everyone else. I guarantee you, when there is a church split, nobody is putting themselves in last place. Nobody is being servant. In another place, Jesus said, when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place. And then what do you say? Yes, Lord. Yes. Paul says that we do this because Jesus modeled this lifestyle. Philippians 2, he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Jesus was the greatest example of all time. And the Bible says the creator, the king of the universe, he became an obedient servant to you and he gave 100%. He gave 100%. Jesus lived, yes, Lord, 100%. Jesus was all the way in, all the way to the cross. Before the cross, Jesus went to the garden and he prayed. The Bible says that blood came out of his skin like sweat because he knew what was ahead of him. And in that prayer, God asked his son, do you love Mark? Do you love Linda? Do you love Kevin? Do you love Karen? Do you love John? Do you love Sharon? Do you love Ken? Do you love Sally? Do you love Jennifer? Do you love Anthony? Do you love Sarah? Do you love Chad? Do you love Tammy? Do you love Jason? Do you love Bob? Do you love Patsy? Do you love Dennis? Do you love Jill? Do you love Aaron? What did Jesus say? Yes. 100%, I am all in. But see, here's the thing. Your life, it's not a game of cards. It's not poker. But we treat it that way. 
We're hesitant. We play close to the chest. We put, a, we put a little church in. We put a little time in, a little talent in, a little money in. And then we say, oh, that, that's, that's for God. But the huge pile of poker chips that's near us, we keep that to ourselves, and we say, but this is my stuff. These, these, this is, these are my hobbies. This is, this is my family. This is my life. This is my money. As if to say that your life is somehow segregated? That you live a segregated life? Say, you're over there, God, and I'm over here. This is, this is my spiritual life, and this is my secular life. Everything's in its place. Everything's got a box. We just got through talking about living a life of joy. Just having a compartmentalized life where God's in his box and you're in your box, does that sound like a joy-filled life? Does that sound like a life that says yes to Jesus? What if it were you? In this story that we just read, what if it were you? Jesus walks by and you run out in your excitement and you say, I will follow you, Jesus. What would Jesus say back to you? Is there something that you're holding out on? Is there a yes if condition? Is there a yes but priority? With Christ, there's only one right response. It's yes, Lord, I am all in. Everything I have is yours. It's all yours, I'm all yours. I'm all yours. That's what a bride does, right? That's what a bride is supposed to do. The groom gets down on one knee and he says, will you be mine? And she says, yes. And what is she saying yes to? She's saying yes to leaving her home and being with him. She is saying yes to leaving her family and making a new one. She is saying goodbye to her last name, and she is saying yes to his, yes to everything, right? She says, I'm all in. I'm all in to whatever this new adventure brings. Psalm 37 says, delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Notice, God wants to give you the desires of your heart. He wants to give you the desires of your heart. In other words, he's not trying to bait and switch you. He's not going to call you and saying, well, now that you've gone all in, you're going to Africa. <laughs> he's not doing that. The perfect missionaries are right where they already are. Listen, I think God wants to help you build some better priorities in your life. And he wants you to start by making a real commitment to him. God wants to give you an abundant life, a new beginning. He wants to give you all the desires of your heart. So don't stop short, right? Don't, don't split your life 50-50 between sacred and secular. You want to be all that God created you to be. You've got to be willing to let go of all of it then. You've got to push it all out to the center. And you've got to say yes. Yes to that abundant life. Let's pray together. Lord, yes. Yes to all of it. Yes to everything. Every, every time I sit through a church service and I get to sing and hear your word, I want to say yes to all of it. I get so excited. I say, yes, this is what it needs this is what I need. This is what the world needs. Yes, yes, yes. And then I just walk through those doors and I allow the world's nose to snare me and suffocate me. Lord, I want your yes to cut through all of that. I want to be able to let go of more of my life and give it to you and be the person you made me to be. I want to learn to love you and follow you with 100% of me, with all that I am, to be everything you made me to be. Lord, help me 
with my trust issues and my comfort issues and my security issues. Help me to be more reliant on you, more dependent on you. I want to live the abundant, joy-filled life that you have for me. Amen. Thanks so much for hanging out with us. And uh, I just want to remind you uh, once again that Halloween is October 31st. It's October 31st. And uh, we're going to be here at the church doing Trunk or Treat from 5 p.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, it's a two-hour window, but we're going to have a lot of stuff going on. We've got a bounce house. We've got a DJ. We've got games. And of course, we've got tons of candy. Please come by with your little ones uh, for those two hours. And then, of course, you're going to get out in plenty of time to go trick-or-treating uh, in your own neighborhoods. But we want to create a fun, community-filled, safe atmosphere for you, and we would love to be the church where you live. We would love to serve you. See you guys. Bye.